This video covers highlights of the Amgen Biotech Experience Lab, where RFP genes from C anemone transform E. coli bacteria. This video is meant to clarify certain points of the lab, and I wish to make clear is not in connection with Amgen. This video offers only a high-level view of certain parts of the lab. The student should use the Amgen Biotech Experience Student Guide for step-by-step -step instructions. Chapter 1 of the Amgen Lab Manual covers pipetting and introduces gel electrophoresis. I will assume you already have familiarity with these topics and will focus on the ensuing chapters. In particular, we'll look at Lab 2A, where we take a plasmid known as para-R and remove the RFP gene using restriction enzymes. This is in preparation for Lab 4A, where we look for evidence using electrophoresis that it was indeed an RFP gene that we removed from the plasmid. Then, Lab 5A is where we transform E. coli bacteria with the para-R plasmid. So, if we were to map these three main labs, we can group labs 2A and 4A together. In Lab 2A, we attempt to remove the RFP gene from the para-R plasmid. In Lab 4A, we use electrophoresis to look for evidence that we were successful in removing the RFP. In Lab 5A, our goal is to transform E. coli bacteria with the RFP gene. What makes bacteria interesting to us in this lab is that with bacteria, genetic information can be exchanged through plasmids, rings of DNA that can pass from one bacterium to another. In Lab 2A, we start with a para-R plasmid. This plasmid was not made in our lab, but delivered to the classroom. The aim of Lab 2A is to separate the RFP gene from the para-R plasmid, and we do this by using restriction enzymes BAMH1 and HIND3. Due to specific DNA sequences, the BAMH1 targets the plasmid at the edge of promoter PBAD, and HIND3 makes a cut at the end of the RFP gene. The result is we have two strands, the para-R plasmid minus the RFP and PBAD, and a strand with the RFP and PBAD. When a plasmid is cut by one or more restriction enzymes, we say it is a digested plasmid. Then, for 2A, we have two sets of samples, one with the para-R plasmid mixed with restriction enzymes, which is labeled R+, and another labeled as R-, which contains no restriction enzymes and is instead mixed with water. So the R plus tube contains our digested plasmid. This R minus acts as our control sample and helps us see if the restriction enzymes had an effect. The reagents of lab 2A are placed in a 37 degree bath to activate the enzymes and then placed in a freezer for preservation and readiness for 4A. The goal of Lab 4A is to verify we indeed remove the RFP gene from the para-R plasmid. In Lab 4A, the sample we prepared in Lab 2A is placed in wells positioned at one end of a slab of porous gel. A positive bias at the opposite end of the slab attracts the DNA strands and plasmids due to their negatively charged phosphate groups. The smallest strands move most easily through the gel, whereas the larger strands and fully intact plasmids move more slowly. As such, the smallest fragments move furthest down the slab. Think of the gel as an open pore network like that found in a sponge. The smaller the strand, all other things being equal, the more easily it can wiggle through to the other end. The shape of a plasmid can also affect how far it moves. To provide a reference for estimating the size of a given plasmid or DNA strand, a DNA ladder is provided. The DNA ladder is a collection of DNA strands of known lengths. The DNA ladder material starts in the well labeled M. The DNA strands should then create what appears to be a ladder when seen from above, with each rung a set of DNA strands of similar lengths. You're asked to deposit the control reagents, that is, the sample without the restriction enzymes, in the R- well and the digested plasmids in R+. With the digested plasmids being in R+, and plasmids expected to be left intact in R-, the student should be able to predict, at least in concept, what the resulting bands should look like in the gel. 
In lab 5A, we transform E. coli bacteria by inserting the para-R plasmid into the bacteria cells. Transformation is foreign gene introduction and expression through the uptake of genetic material, in this case the para-R plasmid, from a bacterium's surroundings. But for the para-R plasmid to penetrate the cell membrane, we have to change the bacteria to a state where they can accept the plasmids. We call this making the bacteria competent. This is done in two ways. First, the bacteria are pretreated with calcium chloride before delivery to your classroom. The positive charge on the calcium ions help neutralize the negative charge on the outer membrane, making it easier for the plasmids to get through. The second method of making the E. coli competent is to use a heat shock, in this case at 42 degrees Celsius. This creates a pressure gradient that gives the plasmids a push into the cells. Competent E. coli cells in Lab 5A are labeled CC. Note that both sets of samples in Lab 5A will have competent cells. The control group, labeled P- has competent cells, and group P+, has competent cells plus the plasmids. Remember at this stage, the term competent cells means they've been pretreated with the calcium chloride. They still have to be treated with the heat shock. You'll use your samples with three dishes in Lab 5A. The mission for Lab 5A is to predict what will happen and make observations with regard to the three dishes. The first contains luria broth, which is food for the E. coli and aids their production. The second dish contains the luria broth and ampicillin. Ampicillin is an antibiotic that kills E. coli bacteria that don't have antibiotic resistance. The AMPAR gene in the para-R plasmid provides this resistance. Because the antibiotic resistance marks the bacteria as having the para-R plasmid, the AMPAR is known as a marker. For the third dish, we use only the P+. Here we have the Luria broth, ampicillin, and a sugar called aribinose. The presence of aribinose sets off a chain reaction by binding to the ARA C, which then dimerizes and activates the PBAD promoter. This attracts RNA polymerase, and then transcription of the RFP gene begins. The point is, aribinose ultimately leads to synthesis of the red fluorescent protein, and this in turn should make the E. coli glow. And there you have it. We hope you found this video to be helpful for understanding the Amgen E. coli C. anemone lab. Thank you for watching.